thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I want to thank, uh, thank Johnny especially for inviting me. Uh, this is so much fun. I have to tell you, I was talking to one of the speakers last night, and I was saying that I typically go to big enterprise conferences, and the fact, or the, the, the opportunity to come to a smaller one, especially based on Elixir, which is my favorite language, it kind of makes me, uh, makes me really excited. I'm really happy to be here, and thanks to Johnny for that. Um, but I did have one condition. Uh, before I came. The one condition was that I could tell a really bad joke to start everything off, because that's what I like to do. And Johnny's like, sure, go ahead. I'll do what you want. What's it going to be? And he's like, well, I don't know. Give me an idea. And he said, well, how about something with the Olympics? Something like curling. Curling is on all the time. You know, you turn on the Olympics and it's always curling. And I was like, that's a good idea. And he's like, well, what is, I don't even know what curling is. I'm like, dude, what kind of programmer are you? <laughs> come, come on. Come on, 9 o'clock on Wednesday. Jeez. <laughs> No, but seriously, Johnny was like, you know, I, I, that's a dumb joke. Please don't tell that. And I said, no, nah, too bad, too bad. He was like, no, seriously, what is, what is curling? Is it like, uh, you know, is it like shuffle puck? I'm like, dude, seriously, curling is like from Scotland, 1600. Don't you know what curling is? Okay, come on. That was I just, the last bad joke I have, I promise. <sighs> okay, for those of you who don't know me or what I do, um, I have been doing Elixir for the last, I want to say, year and a half, two years, and I am all in on this language. And I remember uh, the first time I ever played around with it, it was my f with my friend Rob Sullivan. Uh, it was about a year and a half, two years ago. And I saw a tweet of his where it said, Phoenix and Elixir went 1.0, fire up your text editors. And I was like, what is this language? What's it all about? This looks like fun. And next thing I know, it is three hours later, we're paracoding, and I'm writing queries, and I'm freaking out. This is one of the coolest languages I've ever used. And that led me to just doing other things, like exp uh, experimenting with data access and what you could do with it. So I have an open source project called Mobius. I wrote a little book about all my explorations called Take Off with Elixir. I utterly love this language. The only problem I have is that I was never able to do anything with it, um, anything of substance. And as I mentioned, I go to these big enterprise conferences, usually Microsoft or .NET based kind of things. And uh, I usually get tag teamed by uh, friends of mine that work at Microsoft. I won't mention their names, but Damon Edwards and David Fowler from the ASP.NET team, <laughs> they sit on either side of me like, so Rob, tell me about Elixir. How's your cute little toy language? And I go, oh my God, oh my God, you guys are the worst. And so you know, I'll answer questions. They, you know, they're good friends of mine. They like to rib me and also they're assholes. But <laughs> aside from that, um, Damien always asks me the same question. So tell me what you've done. Just tell me what you've done. Why, why should I care about Elixir? Of course, my head's exploding, thinking about Beam and, and Erlang and all these things. I'm like, oh my god, really? And he's like, yeah, 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 I know about Erlang and I know about Beam, but why do I care about Elixir, specifically? I was like, that is a damn good question. So I started thinking about that, and I'm like, well, uh, and I kind of got stumped a little bit. I mean, other than its cool syntax and you know, a few other things, the community's really vibrant, blah, blah, blah. And he, and he looks at me and goes, tell me what you've done with it. What, what, what client needs have you met with Elixir? I'm like, wow, that's a good question. So we talk about stuff, and I thought, you know what? It's time that I switch gears, because I do a lot of writing, and I do a lot of video stuff. Um, I still do contracts, but I haven't done anything in Elixir. I'm like, it's time that I do that and switch into contracting for Elixir. So I told my friends on Slack, and they were really supportive, uh, t telling me how well I'd, I'd, I'd function inside of a modern dev team, which kind of messed me up a little bit. I was like, I could do it, man. And no, actually, I, I handled it really well. That was, again, my friend Rob Sullivan. Uh, who did not prick my ego at all with his little comment about me being on a modern development team. I was like, dude, come on. It's not been that long. And then I thought about it, and I'm like, geez, you know, I contract a lot uh, still to this day, but I have not been on a development team since 2009. And that was back when I worked at Microsoft. And before that, I had, that's all I did. I worked on huge projects, huge enterprise kinds of things at Microsoft, I was CTO of two companies, just blah, 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 blah. You know, I had, that's all I did. But I haven't done anything recently, and I wanted to do something with Elixir. So coincidentally, after all this happened, I got a call from someone I've known for years who is now doing a startup, uh, and he's, he's doing an Internet of Things kind of deal. And he called me up and he said, hey, you know Firebase, right? You know serverless? I'm like, yeah, I'm familiar with it. Played around with it. And he says, well, this is what I'm doing. Could you help me out? And he's like, yeah. I think I can, but then as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, hmm, as he's describing what he's doing, I'm thinking this could be a perfect, perfect thing for Phoenix and Elixir, and I got really excited. 
And as I was doing this slide, I should explain this. As I was doing this slide, my daughter walked in, and she's like, what is that? She liked the bird. And I said, it's, it's Phoenix. And she goes, oh, I thought, I thought it said Phnithnix. <laughs> I'm like, that's totally going in the slide. <laughs> just has to be in there. So anyway, I'm telling my client all about this. And he's listening. And I said, well, you know, you have high input. You, you need to do like a distributed thing. And it's Internet of Things, so it could really crush your servers if you're not careful. So I'm thinking that this is a perfect fit. We could, you could use Elixir. We could use Phoenix. We could use Ecto, maybe. Uh, I, I like Ecto. No, I don't. Just kidding. Um, and so as, as we're talking about this, he's getting interested, and he's listening more, and I'm talking more, and he's listening more. And, and finally, he just asks me this question. I love this question. Are you sure? Are you sure about this, Rob? You know? And I'm thinking, oh, uh, wow. You know, like, you can go off on stuff with your excitement. You can, you, can, you can tell people just how great Elixir is, but when they say, are you sure, they're saying, I've got a business. There's money on the line here, and I'm putting everything on your opinion. And I'm sitting there going, whoa. And it took me about a second or so to think about it. And I'm like, yep, yes, Elixir will work. Elixir will work. If my .NET friends were here right now, they would probably be sitting there saying, Dude, you're such an Elixir fanboy. I mean, anything to you is just going to be Elixir. And that, to me, is like, oh boy, here we go again. You know, having that discussion again, where Elixir is just a fad. You know, people just think it's the latest, greatest, fun thing. And they'll do anything, despite logic and reason, to use it. I'm like, that's fairly accurate. So this quote, though, this quote, how does this quote make you guys feel? I mean, you've seen this before, right? This is straight off of HN. Elixir's just a fad, you know, and I've had these discussions online so many times. And they're aggravating. But the thing I want to kind of get across is we need to let that go as a community because that's what we're going to face with a new thing like Elixir. And it's funny that it's new, but it's also old because of what underlies it. And the common response that I would hear from friends whenever I tell them about these discussions is, Haters gonna hate, right? Haters gonna hate. And I wanna challenge you on this. All of us here, I wanna challenge you on this. I wanna tell you right now that that's bullshit. That reaction when someone tells you that Elixir is a fad and you're like, haters gonna hate, that sucks. Because it stops the conversation. What happens is it divides people right in half. Where you're not talking, you're not reasoning anymore, you're dividing yourself, you're dividing the room, and you're saying, it's a fad, well, you know, you're a hater. And then where do we get from that? What do we, what do we get from that? We get nothing. We get no discussion. You get no back and forth. So let's take this back to my client. And my client says, are you sure? I can't just sit there and rely on my belief. I can't rely on my inspiration like, totally, man. It has to be based on something reasonable that I can then tell the client, yes, for these reasons, I think Elixir is going to be good for you and your business. I think we should shift perspective on this, that instead of haters going to hate, how about we say peers are going to test what your idea is? That's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. If we look at this as computer science, which it is, we should be able to hear critiques. We should be able to hear people say, why is that cute little language of yours something I'm interested in? And we should be able to give them answers instead of just putting up the veil and saying, haters going to hate. <sighs> Speaking of bullshit, <laughs> this is David Heinemeyer Hansen, a quote from him that drove me crazy when I first read it. He's talking about Elixir, and he's bastardizing a, a quote from Martin Fowler, which is, don't distribute your objects. But this quote here is, the first rule of distributed computing is don't do tr distributed computing. And you can read this quote, and it's so inflammatory, but that's what DHH does. But I hate to say it, he's also right. But what is he right about? Is he right about don't do distributed computing, or is he saying something else? See, if I was to run up the flag like haters going to hate or DHH is going to be a dick, which both are true, <laughs> <laughs> then it's easy for me to just put the blinders on and not know what he's talking about. What he's saying is, if we put on our business person's hats, can we justify using Elixir or anything distributed from the get-go for a greenfield project? No, you really can't. There's nothing you can say about that. So as I'm talking to my client, he asked me that question, are you sure about this? I have to think about this. Is this really the right thing for the client? Do we need to start out with this distributed architecture? Do we need to go full guns with one of the fastest, most scalable, most resilient platforms in the world? And I have to think about this, and I think, you know what? Rails is actually probably better at getting people up to speed than any platform I can think of outside of WordPress. And so I have to tell them that. I have to say that, because that's the truth. That is a really serving my client. And so I say to him, well, you know, we could use Rails. 
uh, we could get up to speed and we could, and this is literally what he said to me. Uh, that's all I got out of my mouth. <laughs> and I said, what's up, what's up with that? What, what, what's, you don't like Rails? And he went on to tell me that he has based uh, one business on Rails and one project that he ran at the glass company he worked at. And after two years time, they ended up with a big mess and they rewrote it. Uh, it almost cratered his business and he said, I'll never do that again. I've had the same experience. I don't mean to sit here and you know, say Rails sucks. That's honestly not my point. Rails is great at a bunch of things. Uh, you have to be very careful with a long-running Rails project. You just, you just do. And he just ran into trouble. And the trouble that he ran into, and whenever he'd like talk about it with people, the typical Rails programmer response was, can you guess? Not haters gonna hate, but bad programmers write bad code. And that drives me absolutely crazy. Like, no, this is a real problem that people have, is long-running Rails projects. So now we have, we have two concerns here. We have a business concern, getting people up to speed, but we also have a long-running concern. What are we gonna do in the future? How are we gonna keep things up? How are we gonna scale? What are we gonna do about the teams? And I call this the uh, Drabledore spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> on one hand, you have Dr. Dre, right? An amazing artist, musician, highly focused on business. The guy knows business and how to make money. And I love this quote from him. He made a million dollars in the bank before he could legally buy alcohol. I mean, he left death, death, row, death, death Row Records. He just left and he built his own business again on top of that. I mean, he was a, the guy is an amazing businessman versus someone who is completely based on his beliefs and his convictions. Dumbledore, right? And I love this quote as well. You know, we, we what is it again? Oh yeah, we have to choose between what's easy and what's right. Wow, how profound, right? Well, what, how do we put this in terms of business? Let's take the one perspective. Let's go full business. Let's do what the DHH thing, put our businessman's hat on. Tell me why you can't solve my client's problem with WordPress, and you cannot do it in terms of business, in terms of getting up to speed, getting out there. And to put this in perspective, 25% of the internet runs on WordPress. When you take away all your beliefs about every programming language and you just look at what has been done, 25% of the internet runs on WordPress. 50 to 60% runs on PHP. Why aren't we using that? That's an honest question. If I have my businessman's hat on, and you have to answer that question, I will say, I can't, and I don't think you can either. But this is where we kind of break from reality a little bit, because we don't do business all the time. It's good to have these business perspectives in mind, but we're also scientists. I'm gonna claim that we are also computer scientists, and we need to think about what we build for our client later on in the future. This is never an answer, right? Because a lot of people, when they're confronted with these business concerns and why are we using Elixir, sometimes it falls back to this, just because I want to. You get into these debates and they usually end up something along this, right tool for the right job. That is bullshit as well. That just means I don't want to think about what you're saying anymore. Yeah, sure, maybe ORMs suck. Yeah, sure, maybe this happens, whatever. Right tool for the right job. No. No, there is, there is actually an approach that makes more sense than other approaches depending on where you are in the Drabledore spectrum. Seriously, are we going business or are we going computer science? I'm gonna claim that all of us in this room are explorers, all of us in this room are innovators, all of us in this room are scientists. And I think that is a really important thing to keep in mind. As well as the business, we also have to innovate and push things forward. When I was younger, um, I remember when the uh, pocket calculator came out, I'm that old, and we were not allowed to have them in school because our math teacher said that you will not be able to do math in your head if you have a pocket calculator. And actually, he was right, but, <laughs> but still. <laughs> Did we need a pocket calculator? No. In terms of the Drabledore spectrum, if, if I was to ask Dre, do you need a pocket calculator? He would say, no, you don't need such a thing. You can do it without it. Uh, the iPhone, the personal computer, did we need these things? No, we did not need them from a, a pure utilitarian perspective. Did we need to go to the moon? At the time, this was a big controversy, believe it or not, but now we look at the Apollo mission as something so much greater than fire and steel going to the moon. It is, it is the pinnacle of human experience for a lot of people, that's arguable. Even today, a lot of people, of course, don't think we went there, but also would say it was a terrible waste of money. <laughs> but that is such utilitarian perspective, right? What about the other thing? What about what it meant to humanity in general? I don't know if you guys saw this the other day, the Falcon Heavy landing, the boosters coming in. How freaky was that? Did we need to do this? No, 
we did not need to do this. But for me, as a child of the 60s and 70s of the space age, uh-huh, that needed to happen. That was amazing. This, to me, like everybody I know stopped what they were doing to stream this. And they just talked about it for days. And it reset their brains to something different. It pushed their experience outward of, to, of what humanity is capable of. I like to think that there is innovation that is just around the corner for the web and for computer science and everything that we do. And I feel like it's right there. It's somewhere. And you know, I make fun of Rails and DHH, but the truth is the innovation that came with Web 2.0 happened because of Rails. In fact, I would I'll make this claim too that we wouldn't be here without Rails, without Ruby, without DHH. We are the next level here of that experience. Jose looked at the, looked at the beauty of Ruby and said, you know what, we can do this with Erlang. And it's awesome. What can we then do with that? Where's the next innovation? What's the big change that's going to happen? I like to think it's out there, although I will admit Web 3.0 is kind of a lame name. <laughs> this is Marie Curie, one of my favorite scientists, and I love this quote because it reminds me so much of why I love programming. It reminds me so much of when I take the businessman's hat off and put on my scientist hat or my, com my programmer's hat, what the inspiration is for me sitting down and writing programs. And I love this, this notion. She got to go down in her basement with her husband, who was also a scientist, and, and find out all these wonderful things about plutonium and, and, and radiation and whatnot. But one of her quotes that I really, really love is this one. Nothing is to be feared if you can understand it. Seek understanding. So it's not enough just to discover. It's not enough just to know. It's like, oh yeah, elixir's rad. Why is it rad? And then you can explain to other people. You can tell them why it's so cool. You can tell my... I was about to say a really bad word. <laughs> you can tell my enterprise Microsoft friends why it's so cool without using bad words. The neat thing is there's only one thing that we need to do as fellow scientists when it comes to understanding. One thing. Shout it out if you think you know what it is. Simply to listen. That's a good life goal for anything, but especially the next two days while you're here, while you're sitting in the rooms, you're, you're sitting here listening to the speakers talk. Clear your brain. Empty all your preconceptions. Don't come here loaded with haters gonna hate kind of mentality because people are gonna come up here and challenge you and challenge what you think. And if we want to expand computer science and find that next innovation, it's critical that we not just listen, but truly listen. Empty the brain. Don't try and explain things to people. Don't think that they don't know what they're talking about just because you have an idea that you think is right. Listen to what everybody's saying because it's so critical. We right now, in my mind, are at a bit of a renaissance point. That's why I chose this graphic right here, where we are literally changing humanity right now with computer science. Over the last 30 years, the web has grown to a point where it's redefined the human experience. Not just the web, but also mobile, everything about it. I mean, I literally do not recognize this world today from when I was a child. With Twitter, Facebook, all the things you're capable of doing with that phone in your pocket, overthrowing governments, people talking to each other, making friendships. There's friends in here that I've met twice in person, but I've known them for years and I feel like they're some of my very best friends in life, which is weird. To me, that's really weird. It's important that we recognize that we are at the Renaissance and we need to definitely treat it as scientists would. We need to engage in a way that is, what's the word I'm looking for? as appealing and open as we possibly can, because you don't get anywhere, as I keep saying, by pounding on each other, screaming at people, just saying, Elixir, Phoenix, Ecto, what's wrong with you? Someone made a quip to me the other day, like, oh, what are you gonna talk about? You know, how much you hate Phoenix? <laughs> Which is funny, it was a joke, but it's like, you know, we all have our opinions, right? We all have our opinions about what things are, and maybe I don't like Phoenix, and maybe I have not, I shouldn't even say don't like, because that's not even true. I have issues with certain frameworks and ways that they do things. Let's talk about that because maybe, one, I'm misunderstanding something, and two, maybe you're not seeing something that I'm seeing. Things change and people don't like it when things change. And unfortunately, in our industry, things are constantly changing. And part of this, part of, part of growing and, and changing with it is to be able to speak to each other and understand. I think it's really important to not just stand here and wave my arms and say, in the last 30 years, everything has changed. It's true. 1990, I think that happened like, I don't know, was maybe before you guys were born. <laughs> 1990, there was one website, and this is it. This is the CERN website. This is Tim Berners-Lee, he, he made the web. This is the very first web page ever made. I love this, this first link up here. What's out there? Well, nothing's out there. 
Well, yeah, it's just crazy. Nothing's out there. The web did not exist until this page right here, which I think is, is amazing. And if you're curious, yeah, that's the HTML. That's what it looked like. I was, that's the first thing, of course, I did view source on that. Since then, since then, over 30 years have gone by, and this is what the web looks like now. It's gigantic. As I mentioned, it's changed everything about life, about humanity over the last 30 years. And I don't think people keep that in mind very much. I don't think they have that perspective. Uh, when they engage in a lot of technical discussions or go to conferences or whatever, and it's early in the morning and you haven't had your coffee and you're kind of sitting through this talk where this guy is just waving his arms a lot. But I would love it if we could all just sort of think about that, have that in the back of our heads that we are here at the tip of the spear, literally something brand new, something old. Elixir is so wonderful. I can't, I can't keep saying that enough. I'm hoping that there's more that we can do with it because language shapes things. Language shapes capabilities of applications. You kind of know it when you're looking at a certain type of application built in the language. I know it when I'm looking at a .NET website. I know it in a minute, usually. I know it when I'm looking at a crappy Node JavaScript website because usually it doesn't work. <laughs> it's, it's true, sorry. <laughs> Don't be a jerk, Rob. <laughs> the web is shaped by the languages we use. And if we're going to push this thing forward, we really have to rethink what languages we're going to use to do it. The capabilities of those languages. This is when you put on our scientist's hat, on our explorer's hat, and see what's possible. And you see something as elegant and wonderful as Elixir, you would think that we could morph that into what the web looks like. I'd like to do that. Because right now, what I see when I look at the web, honestly, and this is me being a jerk again, sorry, I see kind of a trash pile. I mean, what jo I, I'm actually kind of discouraged with how much JavaScript is out there. And I say this, I try and say this not in a mean way, even though it's going to come out this way. I've been doing nothing but Node over the last six or seven years. And I, I think about this sometimes. This language was built over a 10-day period in 1995 because Netscape needed to, to script its interface. It is widely recognized as one of the, wor one of the worst languages ever created. Of course, now it's being, it's being repaired. It's being made better. But think about that perspective. Oh, it's so much better these days. We're fixing it. <laughs> Great, good for you. Let's build more stuff with it and stick it in containers. And I think there's such a better way of doing things. Because right now, where we're at is what Herb Sutter calls the free lunch being over. This was written back in 2005. But the idea is processors are not getting faster. Computers are kind of maxing out. We need to now go sideways and start doing more concurrency. It's 2018. This is just how we build stuff. Right. As Elixir and Erlang people, we know this. Of course, concurrency was always or going to be a thing. We've known this since the 90s. I think object-oriented languages are catching up to this. But instead of making their language and their runtimes concurrent, they're using architecture, which is fine. Zero MQ, RabbitMQ, microservices, hooray, Docker, Kubernetes, all of these things are interesting and capable. But the interesting thing that I always find is that it's reinventing Erlang. And of course, that's going to sound like a challenge. It's going to sound negative to people that won't know what I mean by that. And if I try and explain, well, the patterns, all of these patterns that are being followed now by object-oriented languages were solved-ish back in the 90s with Erlang. I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing. And I say this, and I, this is about as far as I get, I say this as a way of saying that is a foothold for us to then rev on that pattern. Maybe let's create some new languages or rev Erlang or do something to make this experience better other than throw another container up in the cloud. I wrote a post about this, uh, I would say about a month ago, and I had this interaction on Twitter with this person who just immediately thought I was being arrogant because I made the claim. I made that claim that we are reinventing Erlang. And I said, you, you think I'm just being arrogant? I mean, let's talk. And I really tried to engage this person, just absolutely door got slammed. And I said, do you know anything about Erlang? This is how we ended the discussion. Do you know anything about Erlang? He said, I don't know. Actor model? There's no silver bullet. That's the other quote I hate. <laughs> this is what I put in my post. And I could see how this would come off as negative. I can see how a lot of the things that I've been saying are negative. And again, I don't mean to stand up here and like crap all over every other platform, even though that's how it's sounding. But to see the, the deficiencies that are out there and how they can be changed by something that you can you can then use a uh, language that you like, like Elixir. That perspective is gigantic. And if we could just get past that hurdle of like, you're being a dick, Rob. OK, how about we talk now? And we can, I can explain to you why I think Erlang is a better solution than whatever. I think about 
Joe Armstrong looking through his telescope. That's not him, actually. <laughs> Pretty close, don't you think? This is Galileo looking through his telescope uh, at the moons of Jupiter. The very first time that the moons of Jupiter are ever seen with the naked eye. And I think about what would, what would happen if, for some reason, we had never seen the moons of Jupiter, we'd never seen the rings of Saturn. What would happen if that happened today? And I think about that a lot. Like, what if it hit Hacker News? <laughs> These are actual quotes from cardinals at his trial. Bellarmine has this great one. I love it. To assert that the Earth revolves around the sun is as erroneous as to claim that uh, Jesus was not born of a virgin. <laughs> but to them at the time, that was just the way things were. Their belief shaped everything about their reality. And they were just like, well, pff, there's no way. And Galileo's like, but you just, I have this telescope. You can look through it and you can see. And like, nope, that doesn't happen. To put this in perspective, uh, for modern times, this is Jeff Clark. I don't know if anybody in here is into surfing at all. I grew up in Los Angeles. I love surfing. But this is Jeff Clark, and he's taking off on a wave at a, a break called Mavericks. Has anybody here heard of Mavericks before? Yay! Mavericks is consistently rated in the top five uh, waves in the entire world. Uh, it is one of the most amazing waves out there, and it was discovered in 1992, which is crazy. It's 30 miles south, uh, or excuse me, 30 minutes south of San Francisco in Half Moon Bay. It's really easy to get to. You can see it from the top of a bluff. Jeff Clark went to school in Half Moon Bay, and he sat on top of this bluff, and he looked out at these waves, and he said, you know what? Those waves are gigantic. I'm going to go ride them. And his friend's like, you're crazy. And this is back in the 80s. And so he decided one day after school he was going to paddle out there. It's about a half-mile paddle out from the bay, and you get on these gigantic monster waves, and he freaked out. So he goes back, and he starts trying to tell people, and no one believed him. And you know, why, you know why no one believed him? This is great. I can't believe this happened in like when I was alive because those waves only happen in Hawaii. There's no such thing as a 30-foot or 20-foot wave here in California. So he tried to get his friends to take pictures to prove it, and no one would believe it. I didn't believe it. Like the first time I saw the, the magazine article, I'm like, no, those waves only happen in Hawaii. There's no way that that kind of wave could happen here. If he tried to bring it up in conversation, people shut him down immediately. Nope doesn't happen here. And if you tried to bring it up, he got shouted at. And finally, this is funny, finally, Surfer Magazine, I remember this, uh, I bought this, California goes off. And this whole pictorial spread about Mavericks. And people are like, what is that? And next thing you know, the Hawaiians come over, and they start writing it, and they say, yes. <laughs> like, oh, really? <laughs> OK. All you had to do was to go out on this bluff. I've got a map here. Right down there at the bottom, which you can't see, sorry, but right down there is Mavericks, right off the tip of the bluff. You just had to go 30 minutes south. You could park right out there on the tip, walk about 20 yards to get to the bluff, bring a lunch. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful drive. You can go down there when you're getting your pumpkins because they have pumpkin patches everywhere, and you can watch these waves. You just had to look, <laughs> but no one believed it. This is how I felt when I started learning Elixir and then diving into OTP. Has this really always been here since the 90s? Why have I not been using this? Like, why are more people using this? This is amazing. And to me, it was like dropping into like a gigantic wave just in my backyard. Like, are you serious? I have all this power right now. And I want to wind this up by taking it all the way back to my client. And are you sure about this, Rob? And uh, I mean, I have this experience now working with a bunch of languages. I can use .NET, I can use Ruby, Node, I can use whatever. Yes, I am sure about this, not because I think it's amazing and whoa, we got to use it, but it's stable. It's what I call low scale. You can use one server probably for most of the duration of your, of your, uh, of your application, and then just attach another node, marry them together, create a ring. We can do all kinds of things. It's concurrent. You don't have to deal with Kubernetes and ops which is a big concern these days because a lot of people are more, more focused on getting ops people um, as, opposed to, as opposed to worrying about the code and, and revving the code. How are we going to stabilize this? So what happened with this project? Well, I started out using Phoenix and Ecto, and it was really cool. This is one of the neat things that I love about Elixir. I have best of both worlds. I was able to kick things up, get the POC out, get the MVP up, show them all kinds of things with Phoenix and Ecto, and then he, after the thing, he said, so what are we going to do about this 
thing, you know, I don't want a big framework. That was literally one of the requirements. Don't want a big framework. And I'm like, don't worry about it. That's one of the cool things about Elixir is that I can just roll my own. I can use plug, I can use cowboy, I can just use these basic things and you don't have to worry about it because I can make exactly what you want. And I hesitated when I put this slide in here because I figured that it might upset a few people in the room. And if it did upset you, what I just said about Phoenix and Ecto, ask yourself why. Why do you care? Why are you having this emotional response? I actually have a lot of reasons for wanting to roll my own, which yes, I know, sounds kind of crazy, but to me, I look at it in, in kind of an exciting, opportunistic way, which is I can. I can't, I'm not locked into to having like bare metal craziness, right? There's a lot of supporting uh, structures inside of Elixir that allow me to toss whatever framework I want away. I don't like dependencies, that's my thing. But you know what, that's me. Uh, if you have any questions about why I decided to do that, let's talk. I'll be here an entire couple days. Come up and I'll be happy to tell you the experiences I've had in my life and same with my clients. And uh, why I feel like this is literally, we're at the top of the wave, we're about to drop in and I am so excited to keep going with Elixir. I hope you have fun today and tomorrow. Uh, be good and please, let's listen to each other. Let's talk to each other, let's listen to each other. Most importantly, the experiences that you've had with your jobs. I'll tell you the experiences I've had and hopefully we can learn and push this forward. Thank you.